Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you again for today. Thank you that you provide for us everything that we need in your Son, Jesus Christ, and you offer redemption for our souls and healing for us, Lord, through the blood of your Son. May you go before us now, help us to rightfully divide your word and apply your truth to our lives. Father, we thank you and we love you. It's in Jesus Christ's precious name that we pray. Amen. So we will be in Acts chapter 17, verses 30 through 34. I'll start in verse 30. God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he, pro- and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Verse 32, when they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, we want to hear more about this later. That ended Paul's discussion with them, but some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the council, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Well, today we are uh, finishing our our two-part message entitled Our Limitless God, and uh, today we are going to look at the second half of Paul's uh, sermon to the High Council uh, in Athens and what went on there. He's basically going to describe uh, how these Athenians could actually be right with the true and living God, what it actually meant to to be right with God and how that could be possible, what they could do on their end to receive uh, this true and living God as opposed to these unknown gods that they worship, these false gods that they worshiped all the time. When we don't know Jesus Christ personally, we will ultimately end up making or creating a God of our own understanding to worship because we were created to worship, um, even unbeknownst to us. Maybe we didn't know that we were created to worship, but we are. And so when we don't know Jesus Christ, we'll uh, falsely make up a God of our own understanding. And that's what these Athenians did here. We have several main points um, that I'd like to focus on this morning, and the first one is this. There is only one way to be made right before the holy God of the universe. Excuse me. Back then, as it is still today, uh, many people think there are many different ways in which they could be right with God and earn God's favor, be right in His sight, as did these Athenians back then. Uh, but there is not. The, these Athenians built different shrines and temples and statues that worshipped these false gods, and they thought that would make them right before their false gods. Uh, the same thing in our lives today. We may not erect monuments or, or, or cast iron uh, statues or make metal, uh, you know, wooden sculptures out of, out of idols, but when we put anything in the place of God Almighty on the, on the throne of our hearts, that is erecting idols, and that is not what we want to do. That's incorrect thinking to think that that's how we could be right with God. The only way and the only thing, thing that makes us right with God is accepting Jesus Christ, His Son, as our Savior and admitting that we're sinners. By us repenting, understanding we can do nothing to cleanse ourselves, it's only by the blood of Jesus Christ alone that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That is the only way. So we must receive the gift of salvation humbly, uh, not trying to earn it, not trying to work for it, but simply earning, uh, excuse me, simply receiving the gift of salvation that Jesus Christ richly and generously offers. The second main point this morning uh, is this, the resurrection and the blood of Jesus Christ is essential to our salvation. Now back then, some of these Athenians heard this, uh, heard Paul preach about the resurrection of Christ, and they laughed. And today, some still do the same. They don't f- realize that uh, the resurrection of Christ is real and that he will come back a second time and judge the world for all of its wrongdoing uh, and its failure to recognize him as the Savior that they need. This is the pinnacle of the Christian faith, the resurrection of Christ. Without the resurrection of Christ, we have no hope. We have no Christianity. We, we need uh, Christ resurrected in our lives. We need to recognize that and invite him in our lives so we can have and harness that resurrection power as well. It, it resurrects our souls from a dead man walking to someone who's alive in Christ and alive with God for eternity. Equally as important is the blood of Christ. The Bible is clear. In Hebrews chapter 9, 
verse 22, it tells us, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Well, many would say, well, why the blood? This seems like a bloodthirsty, a vengeful, wrathful God. I thought he's supposed to be righteous and full of mercy. Why does he talk about blood and needing you know, blood to be used to forgive sins? But you have to understand, where does life come from? Uh, if a being does not have blood, if the blood is drawn out from you or from me or from any other living thing, there is no life. The blood flows to the vein, the veins and uh, from the heart and gives nutrients to the whole body. It supplies the body with everything it needs to survive. So without the blood, there is no life. And without the perfect, pure blood of Jesus Christ, there is no spiritual life. There is no redemptive life in the soul of any belie- um, any person to become a believer because uh, it's only his blood. Uh, back in you know the Old Testament with the Day of Atonement, the, the blood of goats, bulls, and rams could only appease God's wrath for so long. It was once a year they had to do that every year just to you know, put basically a band-aid on an open wound. But, you know, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, earth, excuse me, 100% man, 100% God, he he settled the, the deal once and for all with his shedding of his blood, laying down his life and taking his life back up and resurrecting. We now have been cleansed by his perfect, pure blood. The third main point this morning is this. The amount of those who we see get saved through our witness is not related to whether or not our witness was effective. Basically saying, and in this context, many laughed at at Paul because they didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They didn't understand it and they didn't receive it. There were some that did receive uh, the gift of salvation. But for example, what if Paul had based the quality of his witness on the amount of people that received Christ that day? Because not everyone received, uh, you know, if he would have thought that way, that experience alone could have crippled his service to the Lord for life. But p- clearly it didn't because he didn't base the quality of his witness on how many people got saved. He knew that he was sharing the truth of who Jesus Christ was. And he allowed the Lord to reveal himself to whoever was ready to receive him at that time. Many times for us, we get caught up in what we can see. We look at things and we have certain expectations. And if our expectations aren't met, if it doesn't look like, uh, you know, what's going on within uh, our part of the body is, you know, lining up uh, exactly with what some other congregation is doing. And obviously, you know, uh, salvational issues, biblical principles, those have to be, you know, the same. But if it's not that, um, you know, we can look at these things that, that are what we see and it doesn't make sense to us and we can get discouraged. But, uh, you know, the key is to not compare and the key is to not take rejection personal because those who reject the gospel are not rejecting uh, us, they're rejecting Jesus Christ. As long as we are being obedient to all that God calls us to do, we can rest assured that he will take care of the rest. It is he uh, that, that delivers the harvest, that we may, one may plant, other may water, but it is the Lord who uh, provides the harvest. Okay, let's go ahead and uh, get into these first couple verses, starting in verse 30. And it says, God overlooked people's ignorance about these things in earlier times, but now he commands everyone everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, And he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Paul was very clear to how these Athenians could get right with God. It was repent of their sins and turn to him, turn to the living God. This wasn't an option. This wasn't an opinion that Paul was giving. This was a command from the Lord. It wasn't like, if I feel like it, I'm going to do it. It was an order. If if Jesus Christ is the chief uh, officer in command, then you know what he gives, it needs to be addressed and it needs to be lived out. Unfortunately, uh, many today, uh, even some who call themselves Christians, won't talk or teach about repentance the repentance of sins or talk about the blood of Christ. It's something that is taboo or something that they just would not want to get into. But we know that that's not correct uh, theology, that repentance is very key. Repentance is, is a primary aspect of the Christian life. James chapter 4 verse 8 tells us, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, we know that obviously we can't clean our hands ourselves and we can't purify our hearts. But what, is, what does James mean when he says, draw near to God and he will draw, draw near to you? That's obviously in the vein of repentance and understanding a repented heart is going to seek out the Lord and ask the Lord for forgiveness, ask the Lord for a cleansing of one's hearts and that our, our hands will be purified, meaning we'll be a pure vessel, we'll be a clean vessel for his, for his usage. And we won't be double minded. You know, that that's a that's something that I think all of us struggle with to some capacity because we still have that sin nature in us. It's not annihilated, though we are saved, though we are on the path towards redemption, we still have that sin nature and, and that's that double mindedness, right? Where it's like <clears throat> Our hearts are aligned with Christ, but then the flesh is always trying to creep back in, trying to get us to go back to our own ways. And it's clear here we are not to be double minded and we are to draw near to the Lord. So, again, repentance is such a such a vital part of our relationship with Christ. This is something that, you know, should be a part of our daily experience with the Lord. The, re- the reality is, honestly, when we hear the word repentance, we should be filled with joy because in repentance, that reveals God's great mercy and grace alive to us. And it should encourage us uh, to you know, sense that when we feel conviction, to be grateful for the fact that we're repented. We know that, uh, you know, you take the, 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 the account of, of Pharaoh, he got to a point where he his heart was so uh hardened that he he could not repent he could not change his mind because he went his own way for so long that he was given over to the the thought process and the lifestyle and the things that that he had devised in his own mind and so you know it's a good thing to to feel conviction to sense conviction to sense the lord leading us to go a different direction it's it is a blessing to to be able to repent you don't ever i don't ever want to come to a place where we feel like we're not going to repent anymore we don't want to have a repentant heart we don't want to have a a changed way of thinking we always want the lord to redirect our thoughts and redirect our minds towards his will towards his word not to our inward way of thinking the reality again Speaking of the Lord, he could have easily just annihilated uh, humanity. He could have destroyed creation, and that would have been right. That would have been what sinful creation deserves. Yet, instead, he offers forgiveness through repentance, being washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we know that the Lord has already done that before with the flood and with Noah. And he said, you know, after that, he would not use a flood to destroy people. But we know that this in his Jesus Christ's second coming, the final judgment, there will be fire that will, you know, incinerate this whole place. And, um, you know, the wheat and the shaft will be separated in that. But there is still time for repentance. There is still time for reproof and correction through the word of God. Jesus Christ, again, like I said, will eventually judge the world and everyone for their actions. This judgment comes through him. He is simply the only one worthy to rightfully judge good from bad. And so this this is what we see Paul speaking of about the man coming to judge the world and who God has appointed to do so. We need to be spiritually mature and understand that our power, our victory over everything spiritual and physical in this world is wrapped up in the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, the I shouldn't even say our power, but the power that's transferred to us is transferred to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. The, the resurrection is so important because the blood of Jesus Christ does three major things for the believer. The first thing is, and the most widely uh, taught and, and spoken about is forgiveness, obviously, for the remission of sins. That's that's crystal clear that the blood of Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, his, uh, his blood was shed for the remission of sins so we can be forgiven, so we can be cleansed, right? Uh, the second uh, main thing that the blood of Christ does for us is deliverance. We are delivered from things. We are delivered from addictions, hang-ups, ways of thinking, lifestyles. Um, intercessory prayer can be prayed, the blood of Christ over people, family members, loved ones, people that we don't know for, for our country, for the state of the world. Uh, 
the blood of Christ can bring deliverance to individuals and groups of people. And thirdly, what the blood of Christ does for believers is protection. The blood of Christ, the blood is covering us, right? Keeping us from things. Obviously, the Lord, you know, like Job, if he if he desires, he can allow us to go through certain things. And obviously, that's part of the refiner's fire, and it's to take out impurities. But you can pray the blood of Christ over your life, over your family for protection. Um, the first one, again, forgiveness. Matthew chapter 26, verse 28 tells us this. It says, For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. So again, this verse speaks to this forgiveness that is given to you and I as believers in Christ because of what he has done, because of the purity of his blood, because he was sinless, perfect in all things. The second, speaking of deliverance, Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 tells us, He has delivered us from the dom- domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Again, deliverance from what? Deliverance from sin and death. We know sin breeds death. And destruction, not only physical death, because we know when sin entered the world through Adam, uh, physical death occurred, but spiritual death, meaning separation from God eternally. And so the blood of Christ gives us this deliverance in our lives, this victory. And lastly, protection. The blood of Christ protects us as believers. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. And this is speaking of victory over the enemy, victory over Satan. And so the protection that the blood of Christ gives to us as believers, and again, this is why it is so important to to understand what is what is all wrapped up in the blood of Christ and why it, it is being uh, used, why the word speaks to it to us in this fashion about it. It's not something to be disgusted about. It's not something to be scared about. It's not something to be grossed out about. It's something that we should rejoice in and be grateful and be so appreciative of that uh, the God of this universe was willing to give his only son as a sacrifice for us. Because again, if he didn't give Christ as a sacrifice, then you know, there would be no remission of sins and uh, we would have to live our best life now and we'd have nothing good to look forward to into eternity. And even if you lived 120 years, um, that pales in comparison to uh, eternity. I've said it once, I've said it a million times. I I can't, my brain can't wrap, I can't wrap my mind around eternity and what that looks like. Um, The number of zeros, it doesn't end. And so I want to err on the side of caution and go with the Lord and receive uh, his grace and his mercy and receive the gift of salvation that comes through the blood of Christ. All right, let's go ahead and look at verses 32 through 34. And this is the response of the people who just heard this about the repentance and and, and, uh, the remission of sin and the forgiveness that's through Jesus Christ. When they heard Paul speak about the resurrection of the dead, some laughed in contempt, but others said, We want to hear more about this. That ended Paul's discussion with them, but some joined him and became believers. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the council, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. The concept, the idea of the resurrection, this was not a popular idea among Greek philosophers. Some thought it foolish that Paul would even begin to elaborate on this idea and for him to even believe such a thing. But others wanted to hear more about this new teaching. And, you know, you look at our world today and I think such is the same. There are some that will laugh it off. Again, this whole concept about Jesus Christ People will say, oh, he's a crutch. You're weak if you need Christ. Yeah, I'm weak. I'm weak in myself. I do. Uh, He's not even a crutch. He takes, picks me up and carries me through situations. 
um, while others will understand and recognize the fact that, yes, there is something missing in my life. There is some void in my heart that I can't fulfill, that I have not been able to to <clears throat> make right with no matter how hard I try, no matter what I obtain, no matter how good my relationships are with my family or people, I still have a void in my heart. And what what is that void? People connect with that, some, and they understand that, man, after trying everything and even trying false gods and all this other stuff, all these deities, they recognize that Jesus Christ is the only one that really gives them true peace, true joy, right? True happiness, true meaning, true purpose, true fulfillment. And so you have those two camps here in our context with these people in Athens. The Greeks were fond of the idea of immortality. So it wasn't that they didn't believe in immortality. They believed in immortality of the soul, but not the idea of a body being resurrected. They thought that your body stays here and your soul goes and that's it. There's no there's no connection between uh, your shell, right, your physical frame and the inner workings of who you are, your soul. They felt that anything material was inherently evil, so that they really couldn't accept such a thing as this idea or this concept of a glorified body because they thought that you know your physical body was 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 evil and you know from that stem even some trains of thought where people would you know within the church would mutilate themselves and in a way to to try to serve the lord and we know that you know uh the lord did not mean literally cut off your hand if it's going to cause you to you know to to be wrong against them or gouge out your eyeball if you're if you're looking lustfully it's a, it's an internal thing right all everything that manifests itself in the physical starts in within the heart you can chop up your body to pieces i mean i've heard stories i work with someone who's you know um doesn't have any arms has has lower limbs but you know it's been said that someone in that state can is still in a sinner you know, it doesn't matter that they don't have limbs or arms. It's it's a condition of the heart. And until the heart is addressed, you know, from the heart, everything else flows. They thought this, speaking of the Athenians, they thought the ultimate form of glory would be a pure spirit. And I found this quote. Um, it, it, it's an anonymous quote, but it says all Greeks thought that man was composed of spirit or mind, which was good and matter or body which was bad if <clears throat> if there was to be a life to come the one thing they certainly did not want it cluttered up with a body so again they thought that in order for you to be purified and to be made right with their god or their idea of god was to be you know uh separate from the body they didn't understand this glorified body and what this would really look like in the context of what paul was trying to share with them Next, we see that Paul eventually departed from among them. Paul wanted to talk about Christ. He wanted to share the gospel as he did. And he could have continued to do so if he wanted to. He could have stayed there and continued to discuss Greek philosophy all day long. Remember, this was his common ground, his meeting point with them, how he could address them in a way where they were going to understand the gospel. If it was uh, Jews, he would have started with the Old Testament and he would have went through the Levitical laws and all of that because that's what their common ground was to be able to meet. But again, it would forge altogether converging to Christ because that is the main point. But you see, with these with these Greeks, with the with the High Council and these philosophers, he wasn't interested in that. He he only talked about Jesus. He didn't have much more to say other than that, and and he, with good reason because that was the whole purpose of his sermon. This was the whole purpose of his speech to them. Without a doubt, Paul was just really beginning his sermon to these Athenians, but. He wanted to do more than quote their poets. He wanted to tell them about Christ. But again, as soon as he mentioned the resurrection to them, uh, they stopped him short because there was this there was this disagreement. There was this contention against the idea of a resurrected God. Certainly, Paul discussed uh, more with people one on one, but he was prevented to saying more than uh, less than he wanted to because uh, the high council continued to, again, attack this uh, concept, attack this idea of Christ being the resurrected God. We know that there's only so much time that one can spend 
ministering, witnessing to someone. Jesus talked about this. He talked about this with his disciples, that there would be times like this and what to be done if, uh, you know, the gospel was continued to, continuing to be received by cold shoulders and those who would not want to respond. And they would they would refuse the resurrection of Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verses 13 and 14 tell us this. And it says, And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But it if it but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. And the application for us this morning in regards to this is we are to witness, obviously, and share the truth to all those around us uh, in truth and in love about who Jesus Christ is, right? Um, We are to do that. There's no question we are to be witnesses. We are to be proactive in our sharing of the gospel. But we are not called to save. We don't have that uh, ability within us. We're not called to convert people. We're not called to win debates. Once you have exhausted the means of witnessing with your words, the gospel, there will come a time where uh, you need to seek the Lord and, and, and ask him when enough is enough. As far as I've gone, you know, time and time again, sharing the truth of the gospel with this individual. And, and you know, it seems to be falling on deaf ears. I, I feel like I've exasperated everything means by means audibly to talk to, to this person. What do I do next, Lord? There comes a time where intercessory prayer comes into play, and this could be this could have been in the beginning when before you even started to you know talk to them audibly about you know uh you know the gospel but there there comes a time where we may need to step back from face to face witnessing to a certain individual and like I said begin or continue intercessory prayer for them and we have to understand this because the Bible is clear that some plant and others water, but it is the Lord who provides the harvest. And I think this is the, the context of what we see here with Paul with these Athenians. He's He's gone on earlier on in, um, in uh, several scriptures before. It said that he had been meeting with them for three days. He had this meeting with the, with the, with the high council. Um, there were some that re- received uh, the message and the gift of salvation, but there are others that, that weren't. And we know... Um, soon hereafter Paul is going to depart from here and move on and that's kind of the same thing with us as far as you know um, not to use the old cliche you know uh, stop beating a dead horse but you know there's only so much that you and I can do in the form of audibly witnessing Um, you know there comes a time where you need to move on and again like I said in accessory prayer and continue to lift them up in hopes that the Lord will soften their heart for them to receive the gospel message Lastly, we see that some men joined in and believed. Among these believers were a man named Dionysus, uh, who uh, had been a regular participant in the high council. So he had been there in Athens for some time and a woman named Demarius. We learn from Paul that we cannot preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without the doctrine of God or the cross without the creation or salvation without judgment. These are all key principles when it comes to witnessing and sharing the truth of the gospel message. In addition, it is dangerous to judge the content of the message by the magnitude of the response. Again, just saying in lamest terms, if you're sharing the truth of who Jesus Christ is in love to an individual or to a group of people, if you only happen to see one or two people respond to the gospel, that doesn't mean that it was a failure at all. You, you cannot, I cannot grow discouraged because we may not see multitudes coming to Christ at a given time. By the, on the flip side, we may see multitudes come, and that is a blessed thing as well. Um, the reason the gospel did not take root there in Athens was more likely because of the attitude of these Athenians themselves rather than Paul's approach in what he had said. Because we know that Paul was sticking to the gospel. He was sticking to the word of God. He didn't um, manipulate it, form his own opinion. He shared truthfully what was coming from the Bible. The application for us is this. 
We need not judge the effectiveness of God or our witness based on the number of people we see converted. Because at the end of the day, it's not a numbers game. It really isn't. Um, I, I like the analogy. I like the example of a baseball player, you know, uh, uh, of, a, of an all-star batter, right? Um, somebody, uh, well, everybody's muted. If we were in church, somebody could talk back. Um, but uh, I don't know. Uh, gosh, I can't think. I can't think of anybody right now. Uh, whatever, Alex Bergman. I'm not an Astros fan, but we'll just use Alex Bergman, right? He's a great hitter. He's a great batter. Every great batter goes into slumps. It doesn't matter how great you are as a batter. You're going to go into slumps. You're going to have times where you're, you're, you're batting 200. You haven't driven in any RBIs. You're not hitting no dingers. You know, you're barely getting on base, right? That's just part of the game. But how would it be for Alex Bergman to simply quit and not play the rest of the season because you know, he's in a slump. No, you know, the the batter, the player gets through that slump and eventually they're get they'll get back on and, and they'll 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 be good again because they're great hitters. With us and our witnessing, maybe there's times where, you know, we're in a season where, you know, we're on fire for the Lord and, and, and we, we sense the presence of the Lord heavy in our lives and we're witnessing like crazy, but we're not seeing any growth. We're not seeing anybody take hook. We're not seeing anybody gravitate to the Lord. And we begin to get discouraged and we begin to look internally and look at ourselves and we question, what are we doing? What are we doing wrong? How come no one's coming to the Lord? Well, again, it's not based on what we're doing. It's not based on us. It's based on the Lord and the Lord's purposes, right? If we continue to hold on and hold fast and continue to witness and share the truth of the gospel, there will come times where you will see people respond to the gospel and you will see people come to know Christ as their personal savior. But you as a believer, me as a believer need to hold on to that promise and not give up hope simply because what we see with our physical eyes isn't matching up to what we think should happen we know that the bible is clear that revival is is an individual thing it starts within the individual's heart and every individual is thought of as very valued and important to the lord and that again it's not a numbers game and if we 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 looked at every individual as a, as a, as a soul as a person that god personally created that he cr- personally breathed life into them right as an individual and that their worth and their value is such that the lord wants them to come to know their purpose in him to to worship them to be made complete then maybe that would change the perspective of how we even look at witnessing a, as a whole and we wouldn't get put into that deception of Oh, because I'm not seeing these big numbers, it means that nothing good is happening because we know that the Bible is clear about one individual that repents. Luke chapter 15 verse 7 tells us, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Again, revival happens one heart at a time. In order to be in a position to be used to our full potential as believers in Christ, we must first get right before the Lord and continue to live that lifestyle of righteous living, a lifestyle of living. Then we will be clean vessels for his usage. But again, we should never fall into the lie that we are not sharing the gospel accurately if we do not see large crowds getting saved. One is just as important as many, and one added up over time makes many. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, just thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for your faithfulness to yourself and that you extend grace and mercy to us every day, Lord, that you didn't make it difficult for us to understand what was needed of us to respond to uh, your son, Jesus Christ, to the, the gospel, Lord. We We just need a repented heart, Lord, that we would... Uh, simply know our state and know that we need forgiveness, Lord, and that you grant forgiveness to those who seek you. So, Father, I pray for those that uh, are in the same boat, Lord, that they recognize their need for forgiveness and that may you give them the, the, the strength to repent, Lord. Give them the heart to turn to you for repentance, Lord. Thank you that you save our souls through uh, the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I pray for deliverance 
forgiveness and protection, Lord, over uh, the things of our lives that are hindering us, that are maybe uh, nipping at our ankles, Lord, that are just, you know, driving us, uh, uh, you know, to places where we're, we're, we're frustrated and emotionally a wreck because of things going on in the world. Lord, may you cover us with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and protect us in all things. And Lord, I thank you that uh, you call us to be witnesses, Lord. Help us to do it diligently, faithfully, Lord. And Lord, may you uh, provide the harvest. May you provide, Lord, the growth, Lord, in your church. And may we be able to uh, take your yoke upon us and not take burdens that we're not supposed to take upon our shoulders, Lord. We're not called to save people. We're called to surely share the truth and live lives that reflect the love of Christ. So, Father, help us to do this today. We thank you and we love you. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen.